Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I doing it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, and when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war, at war with the law of my mind, making me a captive to the law of the sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, may my words this day be your words, and may we all have the courage to put your words into practice, now and always. Amen. Today's scripture is written by Paul to the people of Rome. Paul has quite a resume to his name. He was known as Saul, the persecutor of the Christians. He was given credit for being witness to Stephen's stoning. He was trained as a Pharisee. He was a Roman citizen, an author, an apostle, a missionary, and he was known as the apostles to the Gentiles. In today's scripture, Paul states, For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Based on today's scripture, you could add to the list of accomplishments to Paul an expert in the art of tongue twisters. Of this passage of scripture, Barclay says that Paul is bearing his soul of an, ex of an, an experience that is at the very essence of the human situation. Paul is wrestling with right and wrong and because of our sinful nature is always present this daily struggle is far more serious than simply making a good or a bad choice there is a wonderful book called feasting on the word and it gives helpful insight to pastors on the lectionary passages and about this passage ted smith says if the problem that paul is discussing were weakness of human will then reconciliation would require nothing more than a little extra willpower. Jesus would be something like a really good life coach and someone who could help us keep our resolutions. If the problem, however, is the power of sin to twist the good gifts of God, even the law, to evil ends, then deliverance requires a defeat of that power of God. And that is our goal for today. How do we have that abundant life when the sin that dwells within us can distort the good gifts given to us by God? Paul is wrestling with this. And he comes to the conclusion that this power of sin compels him to stay away from good. And it actually forces him to do that which he knows to be wrong. He knew what was right and he wanted to do it and yet somehow he never could. And he knew what was wrong and that was the last thing he wanted to do and yet somehow that went to the very core of his soul. 
I think all human beings have this struggle within themselves, this desire to not let their sinful behaviors overtake their lives. There is a constant fight to let the good of us be in control and constantly not allow the evil to take control of our lives. And when you throw in a Christian life into that human equation, when one becomes a Christian or leads a Christian life, that sin that dwells within us doesn't disappear, it doesn't go away. And sometimes it can intensify us and we strive to live in a way that God would be pleased. Most of us know how to live a right life. There are rules and guidelines in place in most every aspect of our lives. We have instructions we follow if we go to school or we have jobs in the workplace. We have laws that govern our society. We follow God's law and are guided by scripture. There are moral and ethical principles that help us to know what path to choose. And we have social norms in place so that we can live in a way that respects each other as individuals adhering to what is right and wrong. Now, if to know the right thing meant that we would automatically do the right thing, then this wouldn't be a problem for us. Unfortunately, knowledge does not make a person good, and knowing is a long way from doing. Let me give you an example. One of the things I love to do is, is I know how to play pool, how to play billiards. There are several games that I enjoy to play. I know the rules. I know the geometry of the game. I understand the nuances of the equipment. I have watched the masters of the game for years, and I love watching those trick shot shows on ESPN. I have great knowledge of billiards and a working understanding of the mechanics of the game, but I'm not any good at it. I stink <laughs> at playing pool. Knowing the game is a long way from being able to play or master the game. And our struggle to do good and to stay away from evil works under the same principle. A person may have knowledge of moral and ethical behavior, of being good or bad. They may be the nicest person to ever have lived. They may even be able to quote scripture, to explain passages in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that they know or that they will choose to always do what is right. And life is complex. Sometimes the decision to do what is right is clouded by other factors. Max Lucado in his book, Cure for the Common Life, gives some examples of right and wrong decisions. And he says in his book, consider the following scenario. You're a photographer for a really big ad agency, and your boss wants to promote you into a new position, one that would double your salary. The job is the head photographer for an adult magazine. Saying yes would be a great step financially, and it would polish your reputation and your career. Saying yes would also go against the gifts and talents that God gave you. What would you choose? As we go through life, we are faced with right and wrong, good and bad decisions that will affect our lives for years to come all the time. And so the question is not what we choose per se, the question is how do we solve this internal dilemma? How do we do what we know to be right and stay away from that which we know in our hearts to be wrong? Some might say choosing right and wrong, choosing right and avoiding wrong is simply a matter of willpower. If I am determined enough, if I am stubborn enough, if I am committed enough, if I have the will, I can force myself into doing the right thing. My father was one of the most determined people I have ever met. He came from humble beginnings, tough beginnings, and there was a spirit in him that would not allow him to quit. And that spirit was unbreakable once he had made up his mind to accomplish something. My mother was a very sweet, kind, caring lady, and she would do anything for anyone. However, 
If she felt that she was being taken advantage of, or if she saw someone else being mistreated, she would turn into the most stubborn, obdurate, tenacious person on the planet. But as determined, as stubborn, as tenacious as my parents were, their willpower was never their driving force because they knew that sheer will is not enough to conquer the sin that dwells inside of us. When confronted by the crowd and asked if he knew, let me go back a minute. The best example I can think of is Peter. Let's go back to Peter. Peter was a great disciple. And he has this reputation of being strong, strong, of going head first into situations. And this is the best example that I know in the Gospels of knowing what's right and can't do what's right. Peter had that opportunity to say yes and do the right thing on the night of Jesus' arrest when he was in the garden watching and he couldn't do it. When he was asked if he knew who Jesus was, he could not say, yes, I know him. He knew it was the right thing because before he got to that courtyard, he said, even if I must die, I would never deny you. And then when he was faced with it, not only did he fail, he failed three times to do the right thing. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For the good I do, for the good I want to do, I can't do. And the evil that is inside of me is the thing that I do. When I have faced tough decisions of knowing right from wrong, of deciding what that big decision is, of knowing what to do next, I rely on something that Dr. Henry Drummond wrote. He was a 19th century evangelist. And his words help me to make those big decisions. And it applies here when we're choosing right from wrong. Dr. Drummond says to pray about it, to think about it, to talk to wise people about your decision, but do not regard what they say as final. He says, beware of the bias of your own will, but do not be afraid of it. And in the meantime, he says to do the next thing. When decisions and actions are necessary, move ahead. Never consider, never reconsider the decision once you have made it, and you will probably find out much later that you have been led by God. When we do what we know to be wrong, we fill our lives with sinful acts. And if our lives are full of sinfulness, God cannot fill us. But when we stay on that right path, when we empty ourselves of our sinfulness, then God has a container in which he can fill with his love and his grace and his mercy. The only way to know right, the only way to choose right, is to know Christ. As strong as we are, we cannot do this on our own. So we have to know Jesus. We need to know who he is. We need to know what he stands for. We need to know his love of God. We need to know his persistence in doing what is right. We need to know his insights, his gift of grace, his ability to forgive. We need to know about his healing touch, his loving demeanor, and his willingness to sacrifice for our sake. We need to choose Christ, and then we can choose to do what we know to be right. Now, once upon a time, there was a man who had a pet. Now, this pet was not a dog, it was not a cat, it was not a bird or a fish, it was not even a ferret or a pot-bellied pig, as some people have had and say or make wonderful pets. This man's pet was an ostrich. What was he thinking? And he used to go every afternoon to the park outside to give the ostrich some exercise. And one day while he's there, another man comes up to him and he looks at the man with the ostrich and he can see the weight of the world in his eyes. He can see the tiredness. He can see how hard and difficult his life is just, just by looking at him. So he says, does an ostrich make a good pet? And the man says, no, they do not. Ostriches are very selfish. 
They are mean. They bite. They spit. They go into fits of rage for no reason. They're ugly. They don't like people looking at them. And if you approach them, if they want to, they will lunge out and attack at you. This ostrich, the man says, controls my life. I don't have any friends because no one will come over because they don't want to get attacked by the ostrich. I can't go out to restaurants or other social places because I live in the town. Some people have put up no shoes, no shirts, no ostrich. We don't want them. And so he says, my, my life is not my own. I can't, I, I can't do anything because of this ostrich. It is very hard to feed, it's expensive, and because of the violent outbursts, it is prone to destroy my furniture, and I'm always fixing holes that I find in the walls. It doesn't give me any peace whatsoever, and this ostrich is in charge. It decides when we eat. It decides what I'll fix. It decides who it will be nice to, and I'm just kind of along for the ride. So no, it, it, it's not a good pet. And so then the man says, I'm sorry, but I have to ask the obvious question. Get, why don't you get rid of it? Why, why do you keep it? Well, I don't want to get rid of it. I mean, it has become so much a part of my life that I, I don't really know what it would be without it. You see, I found this ostrich when it was a baby and it had been abandoned by its mother. And so I thought it was cute. I thought it was attractive looking. I thought I could do some good by taking care of it. And at first it was great, it was cute. And it made people come up and talk to me. And it made me get to know people. It was attractive. And it was useful for me to be more popular in the world. But then this cute bird turned into a, a parrot on steroids. And it causes me nothing but problems. And, and I have thought of giving it to the zoo or a wildlife preserve or even to an ostrich ranch. But I just can't see what my life would be without it, so I keep it. And I think that's sad. I think it's sad that that man is controlled by the ostrich, and I think it's sad that he can't simply give it away. The ostrich is our sinfulness that dwells inside of us. And at first it's attractive. At first that habit isn't a bad habit, it's manageable. Whatever that sin is that controls us, that keeps us down, that stops us from having a life of our own. And the sad thing is, like the ostrich, we really can't give up that behavior that's holding us back from God. It becomes part of us part of us. I want to do what is right, but I don't. And the evil that I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing anyway. And so then we are full and we cannot be filled up by Christ because all of that sinful behavior is in the way. But it's really easy. We simply invite Jesus to come in. We let him fill up where the sinfulness is. Step by step, little by little, day by day, we get to know Christ and we let him be the one in control of our lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day. Let us realize that the sin dwells inside of us and let us fill what's inside of us with your Son, now and always. Amen.